I'm Carl Watton, I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of Exeter and I study the migration of hoverflies. My name's Will Hawkes and I'm Carl's PhD student and I focus on insect migration of course but more of a broader scale so anything that's migrating down is my focus. Will has a, a great talent for um, identifying many different insects and we're putting that to good use with his research at the minute. How good is Will at identifying insects? <laughs> Will and uh, another student, Ted, so Will and Ted's amazing adventure to the Alps, <laughs> which happened two years ago now, was it? So whilst we were there, we were moth trapping. Um, we were up at about 2,000 metres, staying in a hut, uh, so we were quite a long way away from, you know, medical <laughs> help, for example, and a moth flew into Ted's ear. And he tried to get it out by kind of poking his finger in, which just poked it further into his ear. So we spent the next probably two hours trying to get it out with kind of various implements that we found around the hut that we were staying in with oil, with water. Uh, I found Will with some very sharp forceps in Ted's ear <laughs> at one point. But whilst he was shining a light in Ted's ear, we went, ah, it's... Uh, a, was it silver ermine moth yeah. and identified it in his ear? <laughs> An apple tree yeah. ermine. An actually. apple tree ermine, <laughs> there you go. It's actually a really pretty moth, not in the most beautiful of situations, of course, but um, it's about a centimetre long and it's almost like a Dalmatian. It's white and with little black spots all over it. Yeah. <laughs> I recognise that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the moth didn't make it. Were you always interested in... Mm. Yeah, I've always been interested. Picking, I think insects are great because you can really get hands on with them. You can pick them up and uh, and show people and just really get close and watch them. The trade off is that I'm very one dimensional as a person, so it's only insects <laughs> I'm interested in. If anyone talks about anything else, I just zone out completely. In my case, uh, as Will reminds me quite often, I'm not an entomologist. Uh, my path into insects are really uh, through interest in biological phenomenon, in this case migration. Um, so for me they're a really uh, interesting and useful tool for that. You can do many things with them that you can't do with birds or with fish for example. So you've, you've seen up in our lab we have colonies of hoverflies. We can rear them in different ways. We can do different experiments with them to see how they fly and see what cues they respond to. And these kind of things are really difficult to do with, with other migrants. So for me it's about actually addressing a biological question. Um, you know. Uh, how does migration occur? <coughs> the hoverflies split into three main groups. Lower in the, the kind of the lower part of the phylogeny are hoverflies whose larvae live in ants' nests, and they were mistaken for mollusks originally, so they're very flattened, armoured, round larvae. Then you have um, the rat-tailed maggots. So these are larvae which live within rotting vegetation, slurry pits and stuff like this. And then you have uh, the, the hoverflies that we're looking at, which their larvae eat aphids. So I think, how many species are there? 6,000, is that too many? Overall, globally, I think you're yeah, about six, right. Yeah, 6,000, something like this. Yeah. So there's many species. There's that many species in there. They're all pollinating. Some of them are breaking down biological matter, so that's another important ecological role. And some of them are eating crop pests, so that's obviously a really important role for agriculture. The life cycle starts when the mother hoverfly is out looking for colonies of aphids, and she's going to find a suitable colony of aphids and lay her egg amongst them. That hoverfly will then hatch in about three days. Um, it'll go through three larval stages, during which time it'll eat about 400 aphids. Um, it'll then pupate. Actually, it's very interesting. So the, the larvae looks like a, a bird poo. The pupae looks like a snail. And then the adult, when it hatches, of course, looks like a wasp. So they have mimicry in every stage of its life, which is kind of unique. That's just bonkers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're a pretty good bird poo. They're not such a good snail. They're good wasps as well and sort of good bee mares because not only do they look like them, when they're caught or captured, um, they sound like them as well. And so bumblebees, oh, they will have the same sound, when, which is quite a high-pitched high -pitched buzz when they're captured. 
and all bumblebees mimic each other to make it easy for the bird to recognize, oh, I've caught a bumblebee, it could sting me, so let it go. And then the hoverflies also do the same thing. If they're captured, they make this high-pitched buzzing sound in order to put off the bird or whatever's caught them. And some of them are remarkable mimics. They fool you, right? Yeah. So yeah. they are, yeah. <laughs> The life cycles will take about 10 days, something like this. Um, so from, from egg to, to adult. And then once you have that adult, it will make a decision about what to do with its life. And it can come in different forms. So it can be a kind of spring migrant where it will track up north. So it's basically following the green wave, which is occurring through Europe, tracking aphid populations, basically, and, and green young foliage. Um, it can be a summer form, which we think don't really move around a lot, but kind of will move around a local area looking for eggs. So that's typically July in the UK. Um, and then you get the kind of the big southwards migrant form, um, which will emerge, switch migratory directions from its parents and then head down south uh, to the Mediterranean basin. And it will overwinter there. So the summer form will live for about a month. The migrant form will live for you know, a couple of months, maybe six months, um, and it will undergo this really long distance migratory flight all the way to the Mediterranean basin from Northern Europe. So to understand the migratory direction which hoverflies choose to go in, we need to put them in an apparatus um, which allows us to record their flight direction. Yeah, so recording the flight direction of hoverflies is, as you might imagine, quite difficult. So what we do is we glue a pin onto their back and we hold that pin between two magnets. So this pin is in the horizontal and uh, the hoverfly is glued onto it and it's able to move 360 degrees so it can move through north, south, east and west. And whilst it's in this uh, contraption, we record its it's heading basically, so it's like a compass um, and it points the way that it wants to fly in. And once it's in there, we basically give it whatever signal we think it would like to look at. So if we give it the sun, it might decide to fly towards the sun or away from the sun, depending on if it wants to go north or south. Uh, so that's how we study it. Marmalade hoverfly. Epicephus baltiatus. To understand, in part, their migrant flight, made each year at speed and funneled through this mountain pass in torrents that defy all estimate, we net and pick out hoverflies on sight, glue a pin to each specimen's back and suspend them in a simulator. They spin giddy for a second on their axis, then align and strain, their wings an urgent blur, veering only to recalibrate, take minute readings of the sun in its heavens, make fractional adjustments to their course intricate celestial navigations that dwarf all human skill with stars or sextant, unerringly defining south. They point their brittle bodies towards a warmer meadow across the thousand miles, where their young will thrive and do not hesitate or falter. When we dissolve the glue and let each one go, it is a bright needle gleaming in the compass face of morning, a drawn thorn, a Pentecostal flame disappearing fast, then gone. How my own soul tugs at its leash and strains towards my children, all of us compelled towards whatever we think God. Call it 
the fierce insistence of our own genetic code. Call it love. So we've seen the hoverflies upstairs kind of hovering around. They look kind of relaxed, right? They're doing this very careful movement, moving left and right. They're, they're not in a rush. They're kind of, that's their relaxed form. When they decide to migrate, that completely changes. Um, so it's very hard to see this behavior. We go up to the mountains to see it. Um, and the mountains are important sites because they funnel and concentrate, you know, millions of hoverflies I think we had like you know two million hoverflies through in in 20 days something like this through one of these mountain passes and when they're up there they're really you want to get somewhere you know they're flying south against really quite strong headwinds often and they're not stopping they're just you know making their way south through france over this mountain pass into spain and it's a it's a completely different behavior to what you'd see flying around here in the summer do they rest on the way they will, they will rest on the way, yeah. But you know, if they get the right, the right weather, the right wind direction, they can move, you know, hundreds or many hundreds of, of miles in a in a single day when they choose to fly. Um, so we don't really know how long it takes them to get where they're going, but they will have to rest when they do it. So they they do come down. Do they travel together? Something very strange happens. They they travel together not just with their own species but with different species as well so different species of hoverfly different species of fly dragonflies and butterflies so these are these mass migration events that you see up in the mountains where there are just streams and streams of different migratory insects passing through these these mountain passes how are you monitoring the number of insects that passes through so you, you know you get you gave a number for the hoverflies how do you figure that out we have these migration cameras, which is basically just a smartphone, which we point at a rock of a known size, and then you can see all the insects coming past the rock as they um, migrate up over. And then from that known size, we can extrapolate it to the entire width of the pass. And so we can get the number for the insects going over. And then we come back and analyze all the videos and then count the individual flies going past the screen and then that's how we get the big numbers. Four million frames of footage <laughs> for, for last year you yeah. analysed, right? But from those videos you can't tell what species they are. So I've just come back from Cyprus where we were doing very similar things and I was just sweeping through the stream of insects and subsampling them or sampling a little section of them all and then identifying them all one by one so we can work out exactly what species are migrating over the past. And that's really fascinating because not many people have looked at the actual species um, cohorts before. And so we're finding lots of really, really strange insects that we would never think of migrating, like these really large beetles and ladybirds and um, things like that, that we just have no idea with, but now we do. <laughs> And I think the more we've been looking, the more we've been surprised by this because this type of phenomenon seems to be going on everywhere. Mm. But many of the migrant species we were, we're looking at, people either never realised they were migrants, um, which means they never looked out for them. And when you start looking for them, in fact, there's so much going on. Yeah. And they're doing important things when they do that. I mean, some of the things we found were flies crossing this you know more than 100 meters more than 100 kilometers of water with pollen big pollen from orchids stuck to their face you know so they're they're kind of connecting distant ecosystems they're contributing to gene flow between different populations of plants they're doing lots of really important kind of underappreciated biological roles and it's like cross-continental pollination which just seems incredible that it's all going on. The insects definitely don't care about borders, do they? <laughs> we have huge populations of migratory hoverflies. It's hard to think of a better beneficial insect. You know, they're important pollinators, so second most important group of pollinators after bees. They're hugely abundant, so over the south of the United Kingdom there's about uh, four billion hoverflies 
a year of flying. In the whole of the United Kingdom, there's about five billion managed honeybees. So in terms of numbers, you know, they're, they're right up there with, with the numbers of honeybees. But they're really mobile, they're moving around all the time, they, they don't stay in one place. So understanding where they're moving to, when they're going to get there, in what numbers, I think it's important if you're going to start to design farming systems that integrate these natural resources, which, which is what they are, right? They're kind of these dual ecosystem services of pollination and pest control. They're really useful, but you know they just kind of do their business now, and but we don't know whether we could be taking more advantage of this actually. There is a lot that we can all do, I think, and I think the main thing is looking at them and taking the interest, realising these tiny hoverflies or tiny flies, we caught some which were maybe four millimetres long, which had crossed the sea and where we were in Cyprus, which is just an amazing feat. And realising that these tiny insects have such an amazing story to their lives. I think David Attenborough said, look, what you don't know about, you can't love. And I think that's really important for the protection of the insects because if you're interested in your more native flowers in your gardens you'll eat more organically not use pesticides and I think that's how we're all going to make a difference to this amazing phenomenon of migratory insects. <laughs>